Little Britches, Father and I Were Ranchers by Ralph Moody. We're on chapter 21. I break nine toes. Squeak, I'm sorry, squeak. <laughs> Sweet clover grew in thick all over our last year's peas farm, pea field. Fred told father it would make pretty good hay if it was cut while it was still young and tender. He let us take his mowing machine to cut it, but father wouldn't let me go anywhere near the mower while the horses were hitched to it. I'd had my ninth birthday just before Christmas and had been, drink and be and had been driving teams for a year. It seemed to me I was old enough to drive the mowing machine just a little while, and I knew it'd be fun to sit up on it on the little iron seat and watch the cutter bar flash back and forth while the clover tumbled down. I guess I can pretty near, I guess I came pretty near begging father to let me do it, but he said no. Then he told me it was too dangerous, but that he would let me drive the horse rake after the clover had dried into hay. I could hardly wait for it to get dry enough to rake. I knew just how to kick the foot pedal so the teeth would fly up and dump the hay in straight even rows. I had watched father do it all one evening in the one evening the summer before. When the day was for raking came, father had to put a low seat on the horse rake because my legs weren't long enough to reach the foot pedal. He used the little iron one off the mowing machine. I could sit clear back in it and still reach the pedal. At first, Billy had been nervous on the mowing machine. The cutter bar went clackety clackety clack right behind his heels and two or three times he acted as though he wanted to run away. The old nig kept right on plodding and after three or four times around the field, Billy settled down. Father uh, thought he might do the same thing when the horse rake dumped, so he drove the team for the first couple of rounds. Billy behaved as if he was pulling horses, horse rakes all his life, so father boosted me up on the seat and passed me the lines. All he said was, see if you can keep the windrows straight clear across the field and don't hurry the team at the corners. Right at the start, I had a little trouble in kicking the pedal at just the right second to keep the windrows straight. But I got the knack after the first two rounds. Everything went fine till the, rain, till the train came through and I was planning how I'd be able to get a man's pay in haying time. Old Joe was the engineer on the combination train that went up to Morrison every forenoon and came back every evening. I had known him ever since Bill and Nig fell through the trestle and was always and he we always waved at each other. I was so busy watching to see that I would kick the pedal just at the right moment and maybe thinking about being old enough to earn a man's pay that I didn't even wave to Joe when the train went through. I guess he wanted me to see him wave at me, he, though. He blew three sharp blasts on the whistle when we, he was right even with me. You think the whistle might have scared Billy, but it was old Nig that startled that started to run off to run first. He jumped quicker than our Tomcat did the time I hit him with a tomato. That made the single tree bump Billy on the hocks, and he took off like a greyhound. The ground was bumpy where the bean rows had been, and the big high wheels of the horse take uh, uh, of the horse rake bounced over them so that the iron sat the iron seat jumped in every direction. The iron was smooth and slippery, and my bottom hopped around on it like a like a drop of cold water on a hot stove. I couldn't grab hold of anything with my hands because I had to haul on the lines for all I was worth. Billy could run so much faster than old Nig that we kept turning a little and a little till we were headed right into the passenger car at the end of the train. I just got out of the way before the horses galloped over the track. I didn't know I was what I didn't know I was doing it, but I guess I grabbed hold with my toes when I couldn't hang on with my hands. When the wheels hit the first rail, it must have jarred the foot pedal down. The rake teeth flew up and dumped the hay. That turned the angle bar I was holding on to with my toes and jammed them in between it and the stay rod. When we hit the other rail, the teeth flew down again and caught the rail. As the teeth went down, it let my toes loose, but the double tree broke right at the middle. At first, 
That left the team free from the horse rake, and me too. I had the lines wrapped good and tight around my hands, and I didn't think I could have let it, I, I don't think, I didn't think I could have let go if I tried. I didn't try. I was too scared to think about my hands. With the double tree broken in two, there was nothing to hold the single, single trees up, and they kept bumping the horse, the horses on the heels. I was skidding along on my stomach with the single trees jumping around, jumping around right in front of my nose, and Bill kicking past my head every time his heels bumped, got bumped. They dragged me about halfway to the barn before they stopped. We had been stopped hardly long enough for me to know where I was before Father picked me up. I didn't know how much I was banged up till then, and really, and really didn't hurt much anyway but in my toes. I must have been a little loco because I don't remember unhooking Billy's trace chains from the single tree, but Father told Mother that's what I was doing when he got there. They carried me into the house and put me on their bed. I tried not to cry, but I did just a little. It wasn't because I hurt so much either. It was just because I couldn't help it, and maybe just a little bit because I was glad it didn't kill me. After all, there was left, after all there was left of my blouse was the collar band and both legs got ripped off my underwear, my overalls. <laughs> Sorry. Mother had hardly taken off what was left of them when old Joe and the train conductor, Mr. Duffy, came to the door. While father went to let them in, mother was feeling me all over. Her hands were shaky and she cried more than I did. The first thing she said when they came in was, nine broken toes and four of them nearly torn off. It was a wonder he was ever walk, he, it, it will be a wonder if he ever walks again. Old Joe yanked his cap back onto his head and started right out again. Come on, Duffy, he hollered. We'll have all to the fort and send Doc Stone out. Mother wrapped a quilt around me, and Father held, held me on his lap with my feet soaking in a bucket of warm water till Doc Stone got there. While the doctor was thumping and poking me and listening to my insides with his little ear trumpet, he had told me he had me tell him what happened. After we got done, he looked around at Mother and said, You don't ever need to worry about this boy getting killed in an accident. He must have an, he must have an in with the Almighty. If this leaky heart holds out, if this leaky heart holds out, he ought to live to be a hundred. <laughs> I could have loved him for that because the thing I was most afraid of was that father and mother wouldn't let me handle horses anymore. After, he, after he'd wiggled my toes around some, he told father to get a piece of smooth board and cut out pieces to fit the bottoms of my feet. When they were ready, he had father saw slots between the places of, for my toes. It hurt like 60, and I yelled plenty when Dr. Stone was pulling my toes out so as to make the ends of the bones fit together. And while he was taping them down to the boards, he put a little wad of cotton between one of them, then wind, then wind sticky tape around both it and the other father and the other place father had cut out in the board to match it. He let me rest for a little while after he had set it all, set all five toes on my left foot. Then he started to laugh when he was looking at the big toe on my right foot, the only one that didn't get broken. I had a stone bruise on the bottom of it, and he said, don't you ever holler about a stone bruise again. If this one hadn't been so sore that your nerves told your pain, told your brain to keep it out of the way, you'd, you'd have broken all your toes. I like Dr. Stone, even if he did hurt me when he was setting my toes. Mother asked him how long I'd have to stay in bed. First he looked at me, then he looked at his watch and said, oh, I'd say about seven o'clock tomorrow morning. I'll tape these wooden shoes around his ankles so they won't flop and it won't hurt his toes any to clump around on them. My toes and the places where I got skinned, skinned up hurt a lot more that night than they did right after I hurt them. Father kept out, slept out in the bunkhouse, and I stayed in bed with Mother. But I didn't sleep very much. Before Father went out to bed, he fixed me some brandy in a glass with sugar and water. I got kind of dizzy after I drank it, and I guess I slept some, but it was an awful long night. 
The next morning, Father made me a pair of crutches out of two old broom handles, and I went out to the kitchen for breakfast. Mother had made the other youngsters stay outdoors after I got hurt and when the doctor was there, so I hadn't seen any of them. My toes didn't ache so much that morning, and I guess I was a little bit glad I did get in an accident because all the others kept looking at me as if I was something important, somebody important. It's funny how the word gets around when anybody gets hurt. The day after I broke my toes, most everyone in the neighborhood came to see me. Mrs. Even Mrs. Corcoran came and told me I was a fool because I didn't go of, let go of the reins instead of getting dragged. Willie Aldevote brought me a pair of doves that were just big enough to have feathers on them. And Fred Autland said he knew I was going to make a horseman the minute he laid eyes on me. The one I liked best, I, had, I have come, the one I liked best to have come to see me was King. He acted more sorry than anybody, but father and, than anybody but father and mother. And he'd sit beside me for an hour at a time. And every little while, he'd lick my hand. <laughs> Two Dog and Mr. Thompson came the second day. Two Dog had a little pouch of dried leaves, and Mr. Thompson told Mother to boil them and put the broth on places where it, where it was skinned. I don't think Mother would have done it if Mr. Thompson hadn't stayed all afternoon to watch. Anyway, the only, she only put it on my hands and arms, and they were the first sores to heal. Mother let me eat supper out on the porch with Two Dog. He ate all his salt pork and Johnny cake, but he didn't touch his beans, and I got Grace to bring out a bowl of sugar to go with his tea. Once in a while, he would reach over and lay his hand on the part of my leg that wasn't skinned, and I hoped he'd stay till late in the, late in the evening, eating sugar out of his hand, but Mr. Thompson harnessed the buckskins right after supper. I like to have people come to see me and ask me about getting hurt. Really, my toes didn't ache very much after the first two days, but I thought it might be nice to act as though they were killing me, so Mother would give me lots of attention and more people would come see how I was. I tried it for a while the next morning, but it wasn't any fun lying on the bed when Mother and Mother was busy in the kitchen and all the other youngsters were outside. I couldn't even fool King, and he would only come to the door and whine. By nine o'clock, I took my crutches and went out to see how, new, how our new cult was getting along. I forgot all about the cult, though, because Father was just coming, coming out of the barn and called me to come and see Brindle's new calf. In a few days, I got tired of my crutches, crutches and threw them away. Father glued pieces of leather on the bottom of my wooden shoes so I wouldn't wear out the binding tapes, and I could clump around pretty well. Of course, I had to walk kind of stiff-legged, the way you do on stilts. But it didn't bother a bit about it did but it didn't bother a bit after riding Fanny. Father let me ride her to Fort Logan to see Dr. Stone, so I got a chance to let all the kids in Logantown see that I had really broken nine toes at one time. All the doctor did was to wiggle my feet around a little and put some fresh bandages on the skinned places. He looked real carefully at the places where mother put on the broth from two dogs leaves. Then he said, Hmm. Hmm, I do declare. Find out from the old engine what kind of leaves these were, will ya? I said I would be I said I would, but I always forgot it when I saw Two Dog. That spring Mr. Wellborn, a wealthy man from Denver, Denver, had bought the quarter section where I used to herd Miss Corcoran's cows. He had an he had an artesian well sunk and had trees set out along his driveways where he was going to build his house. He used to pay me 50 cents a day, 50 cents a day to hole and water them when we weren't busy haying. My broken toes cost me two whole weeks working for him, but Fred Altland said I was worth just as much in haying as if my feet were all right. He said I wouldn't be able to break any more toes driving a horse, driving a horse rake now that I had boards on the bottom of my feet. And he couldn't see any reason why I shouldn't do it. Fred must have talked to father and mother a lot because they didn't say no. We did a lot of haying that summer because nobody but Mr. Wellborn had any money to hire help, and the neighbors had to trade worth, trade work back and forth. My two jobs were driving a hay rake and riding the stacker horse. And whatever place we worked, Father sharpened the mowing machine knives, fixed the broken machinery, and ran the stacker. When it was our turn, the neighbors all brought their machines and helped us. 
I always liked working at Altland's best. Fred used to butcher a pig for each of his three alfalfa cuttings. So there was plenty of fresh pork, and Mrs. Altland didn't seem to care how many chickens she fried or how, many sh how much sugar it took to make pies and cookies. She and Bessie could cook almost as well as mother, and they had lots more things to cook. While we were putting up Fred's first cutting of alfalfa, his cousin came out from Denver for a visit. He brought his wife and Lucy with him. Some of the other men said he was sponging on Fred because he loafed around and told stories a lot, a lot of the time. I think his wife and Lucy were sponging too because I never saw them help with cooking or dishwashing, but I liked Lucy just the same. She was a year or two older than I, and while the horses were resting after dinner, we used to play up in the hayloft of the barn. She told me lots of things I hadn't thought about before. Her father just been fired from a good office job and had just been fired from a good office job in Denver, but Lucy didn't care. She said he'd been fired lots of times before, so it didn't make any difference. I remembered what Fred had, had told father about needing food for us youngsters more than money, and I told Lucy about it. Then I said that the Altlands had better things to eat than anybody else in the neighborhood, and I thought Fred would let him would let them live right there if they did enough work. <laughs> Lucy didn't like that at all. She asked me of she asked me if I thought her father looked like a darn fool. Then before I could tell her, she said that only dolts and darn fools lived on ranchers ranches, because farmers didn't need any brains, and there was too much hard work to do. When I, got mad, when I got mad, she said that Fred and father weren't fools because they owned their own ranches and hired men to do most of the work. I didn't want to tell her that father didn't, didn't own our ranch, and I didn't want her to think he, had a darn, he was a darn fool, so I just kept still. Then she told me that smart men like, my, like her father, like her father, never did have to work hard because they knew the world owned them a li owed them a living and there was easier ways to get it than doing hard work. I wanted her to tell me more about the easier ways, but the men had come out, had come out to get the horses and Jerry Alder yelled, Jigger up, Jigger, up there in the haymow. Spikes, your old man's coming. All the men except father and Fred were there. And when I started coming down the ladder, Jerry called up to me. I'll bet you learned a hell of a lot of new things up there. Did you do any good? <laughs> I told him I didn't know if it if I did good or it did any good. I told him I didn't know if I did any good, but I sure learned a lot of new things. Then before I could tell him anything else or anything about the world owning everybody and ev the world owing everybody an easy living, they all started howling and laughing. Lucy's father laughed louder than anybody else. While we were milking that night, I told father what Lucy said about, about her father and asked him why he didn't try to do the same thing. I only saw father mad two or three times, but that was one of them. He jumped up off his milking stool and came around behind Brindle. His face was gray white, even his lips were white, and his voice was shaky when he said, don't you ever talk to that girl again. He just stood there a minute as if he didn't know what he was going to say. Then he put the stool right down in front of me and sat on it. He reached out and, and took hold of my knee hard. His voice didn't shake then, but he talked low. Son, he said, I had hoped you wouldn't run into anything like this till you were older, but maybe it's just as well. There are only two kinds of men in this world, honest men and dishonest men. There are black men and white men, yellow men and red men, but nothing counts except whether they're honest men or dishonest men. Any man who says the world owes him a living is dishonest. The same God that made you and made and me, the same God that made you and me made this earth and he planned it so that it would yield every single thing that the people on it need. But his, but he was careful to plan it so that it would only yield up its wealth in exchange for labor of man, labor of man. 
Any man who tries to share in that wealth without contributing the work of his brain or his hands is dishonest. Son, this is a long sermon for a boy of your age, but I want so much for you to be honest, to be an honest man, that I had to explain it to you. I wish I knew how Father was able to say things so as to make me make you remember every word of it. If I could remember everything the way I remember the things Father told me, maybe I could be as smart a man as he was. The end of chapter 21.